William Desmond Taylor was a Hollywood actor and director in the 1910s and early 1920s. Taylor was a charming and handsome man who was also known for being very intelligent. He was known as a true gentleman both on screen and in real life. But sadly, Taylor's life was tragically cut short on February 1st, 1922. His life and death are shrouded in mystery. Taylor was actually born as William Cunningham Dean Tanner on April 26, 1872. Taylor was first introduced to acting when he attended school as a young boy in Ireland. He became increasingly passionate about acting and eventually moved to New York City to further his acting career. While in New York, Taylor met Ethel May Hamilton. The couple married in December of 1901 and had a daughter together. At the time, Taylor was known for his heavy drinking and was known to have multiple affairs. On October 23, 1908, Taylor suddenly disappeared. Initially, no one was concerned because Taylor was known to have mental lapses, and the initial thought was that Taylor just wandered off. But when Taylor never returned home after several days, it became clear that he had abandoned his family. Taylor traveled throughout Canada and the northwestern United States. Eventually, Taylor settled in San Francisco around 1912 and changed his name to William Desmond Taylor. Taylor was able to make enough connections to fund his move to Los Angeles where he began to act and produce movies. Taylor briefly halted his career in Hollywood to serve in the military during World War I. When Taylor returned to Hollywood, he was met with praise and admiration. Taylor's popularity grew and he began to direct movies. In total, Taylor acted in 27 films and directed 59. On February 1, 1922, Taylor invited actress Mabel Normand over to his Los Angeles bungalow to discuss books and movies. They were served cocktails by Taylor's valet, Henry Peavy. Peavy excused himself for the evening and left to catch the bus home at around 7.30 p.m. When Peavy left, Taylor began to tell Mabel about his previous valet named Edward Sands. When Sands was employed, he managed to forge two checks the year before and had never been arrested for the charge. Taylor had some concerns about Sands because his home had been burglarized twice since the forged checks were reported to the authorities. Normand couldn't stay long, so at around 7.45 p.m., Taylor walked her out to her car. This left the door to Taylor's home open and unattended. At around 8 p.m., Taylor's neighbor, Faith McLean, heard a loud bang coming from the direction of Taylor's home. She looked out of her window and saw a figure coming from that direction. The figure appeared to be dressed in a heavy coat and had a cap pulled down over the eyes. The figure looked in her direction, closed the door to William's home, and walked towards the street. The confidence in the figure led McLean to believe that the noise she heard was a car backfiring. Taylor's chauffeur called the house at around 8 p.m., but the phone continued to ring unanswered. Approximately 15 minutes later, the chauffeur rang the doorbell. He noted that the lights were still on, but no one answered the door. The chauffeur left without further inquiry. At around midnight, William's other neighbor came home and also noticed that the lights were still on inside Taylor's home. The next morning at 7.30 a.m., Taylor's valet PV arrived at the home and discovered Taylor's lifeless body. Taylor was laying on his back with his hands at his sides and witnesses would later recall saying that he looked like a mannequin. The scene appeared to be free of any chaos. Taylor still had $78 in his pocket and he was wearing his valuable jewelry. Based on the body position and the fact that Taylor still had valuables, it was initially thought that he had died of natural causes. PV ran outside and called for assistance. Friends and neighbors arrived at Taylor's home and walked freely in and out of the home. 
Taylor's employers at Paramount Studios were notified of his death and immediately sent representative Charles Aiden. Charles Aiden reportedly instructed Peavy to clean up the blood and tidy up the home. It was rumored that Aiden removed letters, bootleg liquor, and all evidence that would have caused a scandal in order to avoid any controversy Taylor's death could bring onto Paramount Studios. Police arrived at the home, but did very little to control the crime scene. People were continuously allowed to come and go from the home. The coroner arrived on scene and it was discovered that Taylor had been shot in the back. There were powder burns, which indicated that Taylor had been shot at close range. Evidence indicated that Taylor had been shot with his left arm raised, as if he were embracing someone. The shooter had to have been just over 5 feet tall. It was later determined that the murder weapon was a 38 caliber firearm. It was now apparent that Taylor's death was a result of murder. Unfortunately, the crime scene had been heavily compromised and now left very little evidence. There were a few letters stuffed into Taylor's boots and a pink nightgown that had been missed. There were also cigarette butts littered on the ground by the back door. Since the crime scene was compromised, police began to dig into Taylor's background in the hopes that it would give them the answers as to who committed this crime. Police then discovered Taylor's true identity, which only added to the mystery. The police were able to come up with a list of suspects with different motives. The first suspect was Mabel Norman, who was the last person to have admitted seeing Taylor alive. Taylor's butler, Henry Peavy, also had a suspicion that Norman had something to do with Taylor's death. Peavy later admitted that he had been ordered to keep quiet about an argument he heard between Taylor and Norman on the night of his death. It had been speculated that Norman had an addiction to drugs and that Taylor had been planning to help her kick her addiction. Perhaps Norman's drug dealers had ordered a hit out on Taylor but there was no evidence to corroborate this theory. Although the circumstances did raise a few eyebrows, Norman was ultimately ruled out as a suspect by police. It would have been highly unlikely for Norman to have departed Taylor's home, change into a disguise, and sneak back in undetected. In 1930, Norman contracted tuberculosis, which resulted in her death. With Norman ruled out, police began to look into a new suspect, Mary Miles Minter. Minter was just 20 years old when Taylor was murdered, but Minter didn't let age deter her from wanting Taylor's love and affection. Minter was described as infatuated and obsessed with Taylor. It was said that Taylor didn't want to hurt Minter's feelings, so he refrained from telling Minter that the two would never have the relationship that Minter wanted. It was even rumored that before his death, Taylor had become extremely concerned about Minter's obsession with him. Investigators discovered physical evidence to indicate that Minter had been inside Taylor's home several times. A love letter written by Minter to Taylor was located as well as three blonde hairs found on Taylor's jacket that police determined were from Minter. Taylor was immaculate with his appearance and he brushed his jacket of lint and debris daily. It was determined that the hairs had to have been a result of a recent meeting with Taylor. Minter also had a concerning incident with her mother, Charlotte Shelby. During an argument, Minter threw a tantrum and locked herself in her room with her mother's gun, which happened to be a 38 caliber revolver. Shots rang out, and when the family entered Minter's room, they located her playing dead on the floor before she jumped up and started laughing. It was said that Minter's mother disapproved of the relationship due to the age difference. Shelby was extremely possessive over Minter. Shelby previously threatened another director who had shown interest in Minter. Shelby had an alibi for the night of the murder, but, suspiciously, the alibi had received a large sum of money as well as monthly payment for the rest of his life. There were various district attorneys who refused to press charges against Shelby. However, Shelby was known to frequent the same social circles and was known to be good friends with many of these district attorneys. 
District Attorneys Thomas Lee Woolwine, Asa Keys, and Buron Fitz all declined to press charges, and all three would later be accused of bribery. Perhaps Shelby bribed these district attorneys to keep them from prosecuting herself or Minter. As stated earlier, Shelby was known to own a 38 caliber revolver and unique bullets which were similar to the weapon used to kill Taylor. It was alleged that Shelby threw the gun into a Louisiana bayou after the media learned that she owned such a weapon. Shelby also spent significant time in Europe after Taylor's death, and it was said that she was always fearful that charges would be brought against her at some point. Later in life, Minter had an unpublished autobiography. In the autobiography, Minter admitted to being at Taylor's home on the night of the murder, along with her mother. Investigators have said that the only way that Minter could have committed the murder was if she or Shelby had been hiding in Taylor's bungalow the entire time of Mabel Norman's visit, or if they slipped in undetected while Taylor was walking Norman out. Taylor's former butler, Edward Sands, was also a main suspect. Sands had a history of lying and deception. He had deserted the U.S. Navy and re-enlisted using fraudulent names in order to commit fraud, embezzlement, and automobile theft. Sands had forged checks in Taylor's name. He had also stolen a car, jewelry, and Russian gold-tipped cigarettes from Taylor. Several months after Taylor had reported the theft to authorities, Taylor came home and located his unique cigarettes that were smoked and crushed on his porch. Sands had also stapled the receipt of Taylor's pawn jewelry with a short note indicating that Sands knew Taylor's real identity. In addition, before Taylor's death, he began to receive strange phone calls at night. However, Sands had an alibi on the day of Taylor's death. He had checked into work at a lumberyard. Later, the validity of the alibi came into question as Sands was known for his lies and deception. There were also questions as to why Taylor had never strongly pursued press charges against Sands for the embezzlement and theft. Was Taylor worried that Sands would out his true identity? Or perhaps there were other secrets Taylor wanted to hide. The last suspect in this case is Margaret Gibson. Margaret Gibson was actually a silent film actress who went by the name Patricia Palmer, who later changed her name to Pat Lewis. Pat Lewis was on her deathbed in 1964 when she began to confess that she had been the one to shoot and kill Taylor. Before her career as an actress, Gibson had been convicted on prostitution and drug charges. In order to put her past behind her, she changed her name to Patricia Palmer and began her career in Hollywood. It was discovered that Palmer and Taylor did work together in movies. Her deathbed confession came as a shock. Was this just the ramblings of a disoriented and confused woman? Or perhaps this was another scorned actress who was obsessed with a Hollywood star? No charges have ever been made in Taylor's death, and the case remains unsolved to this day. Although Taylor had an impressive career in Hollywood, he will always be remembered for the strange twists and turns in his mysterious and untimely death. <laughs>